What up? Good day to you, and welcome to another edition of Just Talking. And um, as always, this podcast and others of its kind are brought to you in the realm of five. Like, comment, subscribe, notify, share. Help us to con- and continue to continue our labor of love, and as always, Thank you all for your love and support. Today's topic is something that I have really strong feelings about. And the topic of this conversation is conversations with my father. My father was without a doubt the biggest influence in my life from a very young age. I remember growing up thinking, I want to be just like my dad. Just like him. And a lot of my life choices were built directly on the back of him being who he was. He was um, a bus driver. I was a bus driver. He was very, 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 very protective of his family. So am I. He instilled in me a lot of the things that I hold true today. Now, of course, my mother did too. I was a mama's boy, and I wanted to be like my dad. I was a... um, Living, uh, I want to say parallel, not so much a paradox. But be that as it may, I held both my parents in very high regard. We'll deal with my mother at another time because she was a whole different person. But for the purposes of this conversation, we're going to deal with my dad. Full disclosure, there will never be another person like my father in my life. He was everything to me. As I stated before, when I was growing up, I wanted to be just like him. Just like him. Growing up, there would be certain things that I wanted to do out of my life. I'd ask him first. just because I wanted to know that he was okay with what I was thinking. Let's start at the very beginning. May 30th, 1930. I am a junior, which makes him a senior. He came up during the Roaring Twenties and then that thing right before the great uh, stock crash of 39. He was nine years old when it crashed. Um, he, He was too young for World War II, but he did participate in the Korean conflict. He was Air Force. He met my mother. I could never quite remember when. But the story goes, he was at a party in Brooklyn. And my mother was there with another guy. And she left with him. That's what kind of effect my father had on my mother. He had his stuff together. He was out of the Air Force, making a name for himself. Came across this woman, said, thought to himself, I want her. And he got her. 
during the course of an evening at a party. That doesn't happen very often. In any time, then or now. Because at a party, you only have a certain amount of time, a finite amount of time to close the deal before the party's over. So he walked in there single, walked out there, and re- talking to someone in a relationship. Um, he, they went on to have four children. I am the second of four. And all through this time, my father was doing the best he could with the tool he got. And that is the creed that I live by. I make, I do the best I can with the tools I'm given. So I don't compl- complain when things don't go as well as they could because it's on me. It's all on me. This is the hand I was dealt. Play it. Don't wish that you had another uh, did, uh, uh, another shuffle, another d- another hand dealt. This is the one you got. More men should live that way. Make the best you have with the tools you're given. My father. Um, imparted quite a bit of wisdom in me. One that pops to mind was after my mother died, we moved to New Jersey. We were New Yorkers. And one day my father and I were in the car going someplace. And I had dated my first white woman. Up that time, I was exclusively black. I dated my first white girl. And my father said, actually, no, no. Scratch that. I was with my now wife, then girlfriend. We still were in the car someplace. That, that part didn't change. But he said to me, Son, I want you to remember something. You can love whoever you want. Just be mindful of the effects of your decision. Or, in other words, do what you want, but be be mindful of the consequences of those actions. Which is another way of saying be accountable. If you want to date a girl of whatever ethnicity, go ahead, do it. Because at the end of the day, it's you. It's your life. No one's going to live it for you. So you might as well be happy in doing so. But in doing so, pay close attention and be ready for any blowback that the decision may entail. Now, at the, by this point, I had my bit of blowback. And it shook me for, about, for a good minute, minute and a half. Because I was like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. These guys don't even know me. And they're hating on me. What the heck? I eventually got over it because my girlfriend at the time got back in the car and I was telling her about it. She's like, oh, don't worry about it, just that and the other thing. And after a while, I, I, I forgot about it. But what my dad said stuck to me. And it was simply be mindful. 
That's it. Be mindful. My father was a man of very few words. And although you see me talking to you on a regular basis like this in this forum, I'm pretty much the same too. If you really knew me, I don't speak much. Unless I'm spoken to. And then the answer is always clear, concise, and to the point. And sure. I expand when, when asked for an expansion, for an explanation. Which is why I was so well fitted for the podcast called How to Survive a Podcast. Because the core of that interaction will always be, firstly, answer the question. And when you do answer the question, be clear, be concise, be short, be to the point. You don't need to go around the houses trying to answer somebody's, because when you go around the houses, a lot of times you'll digress into other things and you forget what the question is, so you find a wonder, wind up going, what was the question again? Because you completely forgot, because you wandered off topic. Stay on topic. But that's a story for another day. My dad. Oh, full disclosure. I didn't talk to my dad for like three years. We got into this huge fight. I moved out. I saw my family for Christmas that year and then didn't see him again for another like next two, two and a half years. Didn't see it. We then mended. But the resentment from that obviously affected me. Because then when we moved to, to North Carolina and my father came down to stay with me for a bit, we got into another argument. Oh, the argument started because, and, and I kid you not, you can't make this stuff up. My father was up in his room. I came home from work. I thought he was sleeping. So I figured I'll talk to him later. He's asleep right now. I'm, I'm not going to disturb him. He needs his rest. He was not sleeping. So my wife went out to visit my sister. And we got into it. And in the heated argument, I told him to get out of my house. And he said, oh, you finally got that out. I said, yeah, I did. Now get out. He didn't. And we wound up patching it up pretty quickly after that. And we were on the best of terms until the day he died. Now, this affected me. Because I wasn't here when he died. I was 3,000 miles away in England. I will never, ever forget the day I found out. I had just come from the store. I had gone to lunch, working at at a post office, driving back in my car, get a phone call. It's my sister informed me that my father passed. I stopped the car. Now, I knew that he wasn't feeling well. But in my mind, the situation went like this. He wasn't feeling good. He'd get better. He'd live a while longer. i come back home. He'd live a while longer. And then he passed. But I would get to see him. I would get to be with him. And some 
year and a half later, my son was born. So I figured he would get to know his grandson. He would dote on him. He would play with him. He would do all those things that a grandfather would do. And then he died. That didn't happen. My children will never know their grandfather. That bit of information really hit home for me. It really, really, really affected me in a way that I didn't think was possible. Because in that moment, Everything, every memory, every image, every conversation, every word, all hit home at the same time. And all I can think of, I'll never see him again. I'll never talk to him again. I'll never ask him for advice. I'll never be joked on. The last component of my family was gone. If my mother was the foundation, but she's the glue. My father was the rock that kept it all together. And now they both are gone. And I don't care what you think. I don't care who you are. I don't care about any of that stuff. When you lose your parents, you effectively lose your family. Because now... People being people are going to do and say what they want and what they feel and what they think, irrespective of what their parents will want, because their parents aren't there to check them anymore. They're not there. So you're going to do what you want. You're going to say what you want. You're going to think what you want. You're going to feel what you want with no, with allegedly, no repercussions, no consequences. Because there's no one there to check you anymore. So he's gone. And he was going to be buried in about a week. That week pretty much flew by. I couldn't tell you what happened because my mind wasn't there. All I could think about was getting home. When I came back, and we buried him, and the sadness was displaced by irrational rage. Now, when someone dies, and people give eulogies, they always want to focus on the good, and they should. But this is the image of the person they want you to remember. He was kind, he was compassionate, he was generous. All I could think of was that you're lying. You didn't know the man at all. I knew him. My brothers knew him. My sister knew him. He's not what you say he was at all. And all I could think about was, I got to get out of here. I, I got to get out of here 
before I say something that I'm going to want to regret. So I went back early. Time went on. My son was born. I came back home. And I can remember thinking, how I wish my father was here to see this. So you could see his legacy. He could see his last name going on. And my daughter was born. And again, he'll never know. He'll never know. Or better yet, I'll never know the joy he'd feel at seeing both of his, his grandchildren. He'll never know. And that's a very tough pill to swallow. Because when you're a child and you're growing up, you're under the impression that your parents are going to last forever. Illogical, yes. Impractical, yes. But that's how everybody feels. Your parents are bulletproof and immortal. Right up to the time they actually do die. Then you got to come to the realization that they're not bulletproof. They're not immortal. They're not going to live forever because here they are, dead. They die. And the surviving members of the family have to come to terms with that. They have to come to terms with the fact that the people who love them more than anything in life are no longer there. No more advice. No more chatting. No more being looked upon for inspiration and guidance. Because they're no longer there. And my dad in particular embodied all that I thought a man should be. I've seen my dad cry once and that was the day my mother died and that broke my heart and nearly broke me he sat in the kitchen at the seat my mother would normally sit at and he cried. A good five minutes. All he could do was cry. Because this whole world had come crashing down around him. Looking back on it, he probably knew something was wrong. Because she left the afternoon, she left in the afternoon before. She took a cab. She would normally drive. She took a cab to go to the doctor because she was complaining of chest pains. And she never came back. We thought maybe, oh, maybe, maybe she went to work because she had to work. She went to work afterwards. But I think he knew. But as long as there was hope, he'd hold out. And then I told him, and all that hope was shattered. I 
I remember saying, Daddy, Mommy died. And he lost it. My mother and father were married on June the 4th. So, it's been a great many years since that date was celebrated. My mother was a June bride. She's a spring bride. And my father, who also had quite a few jobs before he ultimately decided on becoming a bus driver. He provided for his family the best way he knew how. I remember on, on Christmases, my parents were very clever. Because what they do was that the week before Christmas, right up to Christmas Eve, they put down the presents that they bought. And we go to bed thinking that's what we're going to get. That's cool. It's great. We wake up the next morning, and it'd be a bunch of presents from Santa. And it would say, to Phoebe from Santa. And this would be for each and every kid. Now, they must have spent a small fortune on us as, as children. And I'm sure that they had rocky patches. And I'm sure they had hardships. But they never let us see it. Far as we knew, everything was all right. Even when it wasn't. My father was a strict disciplinarian. Oh, my mother would lay the smack down. Believe that. But you had to be in a special type of trouble for my father to know about. And my time came was one day we were down at my cousin's house, fooling around. And my brother said something to me. Can't remember what it was, but I told him, I said, suck my dick. Just like that. So that he could completely and totally understand what I was saying. The entire block understood what I was saying. My mother knew what I was saying. So she beat me. I said, I'm going to tell your father. My father got home and he beat me. And then grounded me for the entire summer. And I was the type of person growing up where, okay, I screwed up big time. I accept the fact that I screwed up. I accept my punishment. So in terms of productivity, that was probably the best summer of my life because all I had to play with was myself. My brothers could go outside. My sister could do what she did. I could not. So I didn't. I made board games. I made my own paper, made arcade games. I generally kept myself busy. 
And I had a blast doing it. And I tell you that because it comes down again to something my father told me. Do the best you can with the tools that you had. I was in trouble. I wasn't going nowhere. That's the hand I was dealt. You do not go outside for the entire summer. You are grounded. So I made do with the tools I had. I had a bunch of paper. I had pencils, crayons, and stuff like that. And I had my imagination. I'd have to make do with that. And I did. And I did to the point where one day near the end of that summer, um, my, my cousin came over from New Jersey. He came to visit for a bit. And my father said, you guys can go outside. Now, anybody else, I'm like, okay, go up. Not me. I turned to him and I said, are you sure? Because you said I'm grounded. Well, I said, yeah, go ahead, go outside. I said, go outside. Then I went outside. And I didn't do it to be fresh. I didn't do it to be contrary. I did it because I was curious. I, was, I, I honestly didn't know. I didn't know. Do you really want me to go outside? Is this a test? Because if it is, I'll stay right here. It's no big deal. I'll stay in the house. I did it this long, another few, another week or so, it's not going to kill me. I wouldn't say that to him, but that's how I felt. My father, my dad, is buried in Waxhaw, North Carolina. And I'm going to need to go up and visit him one of these days. My mother is buried in Jamaica, New York. I'm going to have to visit her too. I need to visit them both. Because they both were instrumental in making me the person I am today. Warts and all. The good, the bad, the indifferent. They helped me become the person that I am. And with that, we're going to come to the end of it. Thank you all for allowing me to... Talk to you later. Peace.